Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are and what time it is while you're starting to watch this program. This is Conversations with Dr. Don. Uh, for those of you who watch this on a regular basis, you know that I am not Dr. Don. My name is David Delk. Dr. Don will be returning for the next episode, so please do come back then. Uh, in the meantime, um, I, I am substituting for Dr. Don. We are going to start this program slightly differently than, than Dr. Don usually does. Uh, we do have a guest, and he is Paul Cienfuegos. We will introduce him in a few minutes. In the meantime, I would like you to watch a video Dr. Don made for Move to Men. Move to Men is the organization which advocates for a 28th constitutional amendment which says that corporations are not people and money is not speech. And so uh, if we can uh, start that video. Well, in the meantime, uh, I will uh, introduce uh, Paul Cienfuegos, who is our guest today. Uh, and uh, Paul, you live here in Portland now. I do. But you uh, are a reasonably new transplant to the area. Yeah, I've lived here uh, three and a half years three so and a half far, years. And probably long term. Oh, okay, excellent, yeah. excellent. Where, where, where did you come from? Humboldt County, California. Humboldt County. Great. Center of the Emerald Triangle. Of oh, the Emerald Triangle. Yeah. What was that it's one of to? three counties that marijuana production is most ah, significant in in the ah, United yes, States. Yes, right, yes, yeah. right, okay. So uh, are we ready with that? Okay, here we, here we go with the video. Don and I'm 86 years old. Does anybody else notice the world is going to hell? Two of my grandkids can't find work. It's hot as hell and getting worse every year. We're cutting down all the trees. Uh, we're stripping every living thing from the ocean. So? So we're making a mess of things. Can't you see? We expect our government to do something about it and they're not. The government sucks. That's right. The phonies we elect to fix things are sitting on their hands and sucking up to big money. Damn, people. I'm scared for my grandkids. What are we leaving for future generations? I worry about that, too. Hey, I might be old, but I'm not dead. You're not dead. You're still here. And so are you. We've got to get into this thing. How do we do that? It starts with government. It's dysfunctional. It is not working, at least not for us. Never seen it this bad. Of, by, and for the people. That's how it's supposed to be. Instead, it's corporate fat cats, bankers, and Wall Street. They own the whole show. But that's not something we can fix. Wrong, sister, wrong. This is about money. The 1% has damn near all of it. They use their big money to buy our elections. They use it to own our political system. So what if you're old? You're still here. You're still a citizen. We're still here, people. We all need to speak up. We have to be part of the solution. We have a voice. We need to be heard. Everybody knows things are bad. So many people are claiming they have the answer. Who do we believe? You can start by listening to me, please. You'll be gone soon. I said before, I'm not dead, I'm here. I'm going to be on this as long as I'm here. What can we do? I'm betting on a horse called Move to a Men. Mm -hmm. I used to be a jockey. <laughs> <laughs> 
What's moved to amend? A coalition of Americans that want a constitutional amendment. There are all kinds of people talking about amendments. Only one can deliver. Only one can deliver the change we need. What change is that? The amendment has to say corporations are not people. Corporations are people? Who made that law? You know what? No law ever said corporations are people. It was the courts that made it that way. Courts don't make law. They created this mess with something called legal precedent. They just said it was so? So it is? That's right. You know Big Tobacco? The cigarette companies are considered people. That gives them and all corporations the right to lie to us and to buy elections using campaign contributions. They lied a lot. Corporations are about profit, nothing else. There has never been a law that says corporations are people. They are state chartered legal fictions. As such, they should first be accountable to the people and only then to shareholders and corporate management. That chance that'll ever happen. What I'm talking about is a big fix. Simple, straightforward, unambiguous, a constitutional amendment. First, it should say corporations are not people, and that's the first part of the big fix. The second part is about money. The amendment must also say money is not speech, it is only property. Just because you have big money doesn't mean you get to use it to buy politicians and public policy. Does everybody get that? A 28th Amendment. Corporations are not people and money is not speech. You want us to say we're for that? I want you to do it not just for yourself, dear lady. I want you to do it for your kids and your grandkids. My grandkids, that's who I worry about. I'm on this big time for them. Corporations are not people. Does everybody get it? We can't fight the dirty money and corruption with something that's lame and half-hearted. We have to join the resistance. Call your kids, call your friends. Tell them there's a war going on between ordinary citizens like us and the fat cat corporatists. Tell them you've signed up to fight the fat cats, the big money, and the politicians bought and paid for by the fat cats. Tell them you want a constitutional amendment that says... Corporations are not people. And, and money is not speech. speech. Once more. And, and money is not speech. speech. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. You know, it be so And so that uh, gives you a, an idea of some of the other things that Dr. Does, Dr. Don does when he's not hosting this program. And uh, if he was here right now, he would probably say to you, I want every one of you to pick up the phone, not quite yet, but in a little bit. I want every one of you to pick up the phone and call your U.S. Senators and your U.S. Representative and tell them that it is vitally important that they support a U.S. constitutional amendment that says corporations are not people and money is not speech. So with that, we'll go back to our guest, Paul Cienfuegos. And uh, what'd you think of the video? Uh, I thought it was very enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, it was, it was kind of fun to do, yeah. and uh, it, it was an interesting process. I worked with a fellow here in Portland who's a video guy, 
um, uh, named um, Jeff Holland, and so he and I co-produced it. And our crew, most of our crew here today, well, was part of the crew on, uh, on making that, and so it was it was great fun. So anyway, let's get back to who you are. So who are you? Well, I'm a longtime grassroots community organizer and workshop leader. Okay, I'm doing political organizing and leading a variety of workshops my entire adult life. Mm -hmm. I got hooked in college. In college. In political work. Okay. And you went to Evergreen State College I did. in Bellingham, in Washington. Olympia, Washington. In, oh, in Olympia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Western is in um, Bellingham. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wh wh why did you choose to go there? Um, well, I grew up in Albuquerque, and my mom, fortunately, knew somebody who helped high schoolers find the colleges that best suited them. And so she put me in touch with this woman who was a guidance counselor at another high school in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. And we spent an afternoon together and she gave me some aptitude tests and she asks me, asked me a bunch of questions. And she gave me a list of four colleges all in the Northwest because I told her I wanted to be going to college in the Northwest. Uh -huh. I wanted to get the hell out of the desert and get <laughs> to the rain. Uh -huh. And the tall trees. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Interesting you. <clears throat> Uh, mentioned about guidance con counselors because well, one of the things I was reading recently with the uh, crisis, we do have a crisis of education right now at, at all levels, yeah. at grade school and high school and college and so forth, but well, one of the things I was reading recently is that uh, guidance counselors in uh, high schools now frequently have four or five hundred students that they're giving guidance to at oh the same gosh. time. which. You know, if, if yeah. that had happened with you, yeah. you would not probably right. have ended up at Evergreen. Right. right. Well, this was a private conversation. Oh. My mother happened to have this person oh. who was a personal friend. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that, well, but that, you're that, right. that was fortunate. But, Very. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So, um, so while you were at Evergreen State University, did you get involved with uh, social issues or environmental issues? I or? dove in really deep and really early. Mm -hmm. um, I became one of the infamous or famous, depending on your point of view, uh -huh. political activist leaders among the student body. Uh, I organized a general strike against the College Cafeteria Corporation that was serving us crappy food. Mm -hmm. um, and we made seven demands. And the uh, it's still hard to believe till this day, but the uh, vice president of this mega corporation that was based in Canada called Saga actually came down and begged us to call off the strike. It was really? that effective. Wow. Um, and I, I, in retrospect, I think that's probably where I started actually believing myself politically. Uh -huh. It's like one person can do something big. I was like 19 uh -huh. or something. Yeah. I also got involved in, um, I was trained to lead uh, nonviolent direct action workshops against the Trident nuclear submarine base that was being built you know, mm -hmm. west of Seattle mm -hmm. in uh, Bangor, Washington. Mm -hmm. And that was a big deal. It was a very big deal. Yeah. And, and yeah. Um, was it successful? It was not successful. I didn't and, think it was successful. And, and, but <laughs> uh, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, but I also got to know um, pretty well this couple, Jim and Shelley Douglas, who I have always thought of as the Berrigans of the West Coast. Um, he was a radical Catholic um, minister. That's not the right word for Catholic, but whatever, yeah. whatever it is. A priest. Priest. Uh -huh. um, he, he was an amazing uh, workshop leader, strategist, public speaker, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had, um, they had this summer camp every summer for a couple of years, and they brought in hundreds of people get trained in nonviolent direct action. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the early trainees, and I went back to Evergreen State College and led workshop after workshop in direct action for students. Mm -hmm. And we generated two massive um, uh, direct actions with four or 500 arrests each. Wow. Over that next year. Yeah. It was, it was, so, uh, yeah. about what year was that? That was uh, summer of 77 and 78. Oh, good years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was involved peripherally in, um, you know, in a much more minor way in shutting down the Satsup nuclear power plant, which was just upwind from Evergreen. Mm -hmm. Like 15 or 20 miles, they were building this massive new nuclear power plant. We, the students at the college, were not pleased. Oh, yeah. About this, so there was a massive operation to get it shut down through ballot initiative, and I, yeah, I was so involved in all sorts of stuff. In definitely college. got your feet very wet. I did in the in the wet Pacific Northwest. I did. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And um, who you mentioned these two people? Uh, they were kind of mentors. They were early mentors. Uh huh. 
Yeah, um, I think probably my most significant early mentor was Joanna Macy, oh. uh, who uh, through a complete fluke, well, I ended up on a peace walk called the Walk for Survival that ended at the Trident nuclear submarine base in the spring of 1980, a 1,200 mile peace walk to mm. educate the whole West Coast about the Trident nuclear submarine, mm -hmm. which was the most powerful mm -hmm. nuclear weapon ever created. It was uh, Jimmy Carter, our supposed pro-peace yeah, right. president, uh -huh. Jimmy Carter. Um, every nuclear submarine had 408 independently targetable nuclear weapons. Each, oh my. I think each one was 10 Hiroshima's. So one submarine ca captain had 4,000 Hiroshima's at his disposal. Uh -huh. um, that was a little scary. Oh, uh, yeah. And then I did something called the walk to Moscow after that, a year later, which was supposed to cross the U.S., cross Europe, and replicate a walk that Bertrand Russell and others had done in the 1950s. Um, and through a fluke, I ended up on the East Coast in exactly the right time and place to learn about and take a workshop from Joanna Macy, who was leading these workshops called Despair and Empowerment in the Nuclear Age, mm -hmm. coming to terms with our feelings of rage and grief and despair about living in this crisis time. And I became, a work I became one of the very first workshop leaders in that movement, mm -hmm. totally by chance, and ended up bringing her work to Europe. Oh, I was okay. the founder of her work okay. there. Yeah, so tell our audience a little bit about who Joanne Macy is. She is a Buddhist scholar who's now in her mid-80s, um, who, who really I see as my primary mentor still. And I've had the privilege of having her as a personal friend uh -huh. since I was in my 20s. And wow. I, in fact, I had lunch with her in her home just a few weeks ago in the Bay Area. Oh, how wonderful. Um, she's a very special woman. Uh -huh. And she's, uh, she's written a dozen books, and she's taken a lot of Buddhist practices and turned them into social movement practices. Mm -hmm. She's yeah, adapted uh, these guided visualizations. Uh -huh. Great. OK, yeah. good. So uh, after you left Evergreen, what, what happened? Uh, I went straight to, to Europe and was active with, uh, um, with the walk f to Moscow. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. and, um, and that's when I got involved in leading uh, Joanna Macy's Despair and Empowerment workshops. In fact, I left the walk after just a few months because I actually was kind of unhappy with the way that most of the Americans on the walk we're treating it kind of as a vacation across Europe yeah. mm -hmm. and not as a major political event where we were working. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up leading these workshops all over um, Britain, Holland, and France for three years and founded this work in Europe in my mid-20s, which was really something, and then I came home. Hmm. Yeah. Kay. So I had this three-year extraordinary political organizing and wow. teaching experience unexpectedly. It wasn't what I uh -huh. thought. I was uh, yeah. I thought I was going to walk across the, uh -huh. yeah. the continent. Opportunities present themselves and you yes. tend to grab them. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Yeah. I'm glad you do. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, talk about Richard Grossman. Uh, Richard Grossman is one of my most significant mentors. Mm -hmm. He died a number of years ago, sadly, prematurely of some weird cancer that couldn't be diagnosed. Mm -hmm until it was too late. And uh, he was the co-founder of the Program on Corporations, Law, and Democracy, or poclad.org. Mm -hmm. Website still exists. And um, it was the very first organization that was trying to come to terms with, um, well, the, the way they phrased it was um, they were provoking democratic conversations on the topic, how can it be that we have thousands and thousands of single issue groups working so hard on so many issues, but all the trajectories, ecological, economic, social, are all going in the wrong direction. So these are, there are two options as to why. Either we're all not working hard enough in our mm -hmm. single issue work, mm -hmm. or there's something wrong with our activism, something structurally wrong with our activism. Um, and they were focused, obviously, on the second option of those two. And they became the first group, I think in US history that I'm aware of, to dive deep into this history of corporations winning constitutional rights, mm -hmm. starting in 1819. We're, we're, we're now 195 years into uh, business corporations being granted constitutional rights by the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. We're five years from the bicentennial oh, really? of corporate rights. Oh, okay. yeah. So we, we, had, we need to start organizing something for uh, 2019, uh, yes, okay. something yeah. really big. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk later about yeah. that. <laughs> okay. So um, he was like the founding mm -hmm. visionary. Uh -huh. He was a, 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 one of the most amazing intellectuals I've ever had the, mm -hmm. who's out, well, who's out there. I mean, he, I think he's a, 
he's as impressive as Noam Chomsky, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and so you do regard him as a, as a, a, a almost a hero? Kind Absolutely. Of? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was a very challenging guy. He called himself a curmudgeon. Oh, uh -huh. So he wasn't that easy to work with. Um, but he was, he, he, you could give him, I gave him press releases, speeches, etc. before I went public with them. And he would tear them to shreds in all the right ways. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, before yeah. I went public with them. Yes, and, yes. And I, he was a primary teacher for me for six years. Uh -huh. And, and th my work is primarily because of him and his colleagues in Poclad. Yeah. So, so what, what, yeah. what, what do you think of, uh, uh, drives you to do this kind of work? Well, if it's kind of just political work in general, I, I kind of look back at my 10th year in life mm -hmm. um, and realizing that all of the relationships that I saw around me were um, unfair. That was the word that I had as a 10-year-old. Mm. So I'm, I'm a very bullied little boy mm -hmm. in general as a, as a small kid. And I start being aware of the way older kids are treating younger kids and boys are treating girls and thin kids are treating fat kids and teachers are treating students. That whole scene started to unveil for me this level of unfairness and hierarchy that was the entire culture. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of my political awareness was age 10. And mm -hmm. I got fiercely uh, politically committed to, to injustice stuff from my 10th year. I started okay. watching the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite yes, uh -huh. with my mom every night, mm -hmm. pretty much around age 10. Yeah. So the Vietnam War, it's like the, you know, the body counts every night on the Evening yeah, News. That right. was the beginning of my yeah. consciousness yeah, yeah. nationally. Yeah, I, I, I think actually that parallels my experience uh, also uh, quite, quite a bit. And, and uh, the, the, uh, I, I, I was never uh, bullied, uh -huh. but I was very conscious of of, of um, changing some behaviors so that I wouldn't be targeted. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I remember uh, you know, the, uh, watching the evening news, I'm a few years older than you are, and watching the evening news and the body counts and, and all of that, and, and you know, the uh, civil rights um, activities of Dr. Martin Luther King and, and that whole thing, and, and the, the, the attack on the dogs uh, on the marchers yeah. and, and all of those things that uh, really made a consciousness thing. It was like, oh, these are things that should not be happening. And uh, it took me, I think, probably a little longer than you to actually get to the point where I could try uh, to do something uh -huh. about them. But uh, I, I really admire the fact that you started at such an early age. Well, and I struggled to figure out how to be politically involved mm -hmm. because there's really no opportunity that's obvious in junior high or high school yes right. at all I mean like my first political act was was uh, surveying the students in my junior high school as to why they littered oh. <laughs> right because it's uh -huh. like people are dumping crap all over the landscape yeah uh -huh. and I was like why do they do that yes. I wanted to get inside their heads and understand littering uh -huh. So that's the beginning of my. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, and, yeah. and that's uh, that's actually a good good spot because it's uh, it's not that far a jump from the concern about littering yeah. to by individuals to saying why are these corporations littering? Right. Yeah. In, in a big sense. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Why, right. Why yeah. do we let them get away right. with this? Yeah. So we are uh, to our halfway point, uh, which we uh, or Dr. Don always uh, takes a short few minute break here. So we're going to do that, and then we will be back very shortly.
And welcome back. I'm uh, glad that you're still here and uh, our, uh, our, our guest is still here. Uh, so I feel fortunate. Uh, for those of you who are just tuning in, uh, this is Conversations with Dr. Don. This is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone programs uh, in which Dr. Don usually uh, interviews interesting people, people such as yourselves out there in, in the audience, uh, about what makes them unique, one-of-a-kind individuals. And uh, so uh, we're doing that this evening with Paul Cienfuegos. So uh, I'm glad that you're still here, Paul. And so we've been kind of talking about uh, who you are. Uh, we'll uh, now move on to uh, talking about what you're actively involved with right now, because you've been actively involved pretty much all your life, from uh, surveying have. people about uh, littering <laughs> to uh, doing something yeah. uh, in a much grander scale now. I went into hyperdrive as a political activist in my first year of college, mm -hmm. and I haven't looked back. Right. And I just assumed that would be the edges of my work, and it was very quickly clear that that was that my was work. That was the center. <clears throat> and right. then since 1995, I've been actively involved since I got involved with Richard Grossman and his group, Program on Corporations, Law, and Democracy, and then in the year 2000, got active with the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, um, Thomas Lindsay and others. I've been actively involved in a movement that has some significant parallels with Move to Amend that's about um, stripping corporations of all of their constitutional rights, initially at the local level, then at the state level, and then at the federal level um, through grassroots organizing. Okay. All right. So uh, talk about the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. What, what, what is it? How did it uh, so, form? Um, Why did it form? They actually existed starting in the 1980s, I believe, and they were one of these, uh, they were kind of like the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund. Um, they were a public interest law firm that d did pro bono support work around environmental issues, and they worked entirely within the regulatory system. They were constantly challenging regulatory applications by corporations to put in a you know, toxic waste dump or a big box store or whatever, mm -hmm. what corporations do. And, um, and they assumed that that's the only way that you could challenge a corporate um, proposal. And the founder, Thomas Lindsay, got involved in some way with uh, Richard Grossman and Polk Lab, found out about them. Mm -hmm. And sometime around 1998 or 99, they were so disillusioned <coughs> with what they were doing because they were successfully blocking regulatory permits, but ultimately those permits were always approved because the way the regulatory system works is that you know uh, if the permit is what they call administratively complete, all the I's have been dotted and the T's have been crossed and the, you know, the survey, the environmental or the social survey has been attached and signed correctly. The corporation virtually always gets to do what it has applied to do. That's the regulatory system. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter if 99% of the public hearing attendees say we don't want this. That's how the regulatory system is designed. And so they were about to but shut be, their because, doors. Uh, yeah, because well, a, as, as I've heard you many, th say many times, the, the purpose of these regulatory agencies is not so much to regulate the corporate harmers as it is to regulate us. To regulate ourselves as environmentalists, as labor activists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it right. regulates, yeah. It right. regulates our behavior in relation to the system. Right. And it was designed and, and it, in the uh, 1880s. Yeah, and, and it, it, uh, it restricts the questions that we get to ask. Well, it's more than restricts the questions. It doesn't allow us to say no. It doesn't allow us to say no. It, all, it gets, all you get to do in the regulatory system is participate in something which is, a, which is inevitable about how big is the factory farm going to be or how far from the creek is the waste pond going to be. Mm -hmm. Or is there going to be double lining in the creek, uh, in, the, in the waste pond? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, are the trucks going to be allowed to drive on Sundays through the neighborhood? Right. Uh -huh. Not, do we want this or do we not? And so, yeah, this whole system of laws started in the 1880s with the railroad corporations and the Attorney General of the U.S. And they're designing a system to basically tie the public in knots and make it more difficult for the public to say no. That's mm -hmm. not how it's described to the public, Yes, right. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. but that's really wh how it was designed. Right, yeah. And these were all part of the progressive era reforms. Pr prior to the progressive era. Prior to the progressive. This is a, t a couple of decades before the progressives. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is, this is the height of the populist 
uprisings in the 1880s. It yeah. was a reaction to the populace. W would you I'm say that? I'm guessing it was. Well, I, I, I don't I know so. the history well enough, but it makes sense. Yeah, from what I have read about the populace, uh, they had much more of a feeling of wanting to say no right. than they wanted to say, we want to regulate. Yeah, the progressives um, brought in regula regulation. Yeah. There's an interesting book called Railroads and Regulations. Yes. Uh, yes, which goes into this and, uh, and really uh, 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 shows the relationship between the populace and the uh, progressives. And the progressives, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I should be no, letting no, you talk, you know me. <laughs> but the progressives uh, were, uh, were a larger, large movement, but it was directed by the captains of industry. They were, they were actually invited, the captains of industry were invited to become, the enlightened captains of industry yes. were invited to become leaders of the progressive era. Right, okay. Right. Which is not what we think when we think of ourselves as progressives. Very true, yeah. very true, yeah. right, yeah. Um, so, so anyway, the, so CELDIF, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, was really disheartened and they were literally weeks from shutting their door in like 1998 or 99 when a group of farmers came to them in rural Pennsylvania, Wells Township, Pennsylvania, and they said, you've been helping us for two or three years to hold off this permit application for this 15,000 head factory farm. But it's clear that what's coming is ultimately an approval by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. We don't understand why we can't say no. Mm -hmm. And the attorney said, well, there's all these structures of law in place that make it impossible for us to, to for you to say no to a factory farm you don't want, even though the whole town doesn't want it. And the farmers don't understand this, and so they ask for some legal explanation. And the, the attorneys from Seldiff go through this very interesting uh, explanation, which I could give here if we wanted to spend a few minutes, mm -hmm. that basically says, um, well, so basically what happens is Seldiff's attorneys come out of these conversations saying, let's not shut our doors, let's redesign what we do and let's help these farmers to push to pass a law in their township which is illegal because it violates these structures of law. Let's actually push the envelope. Because up until then, attorneys across the country were saying simply, you can't do that. To their own activist groups that, that had hired them, you can't do that. That's illegal. That's unconstitutional. It violates state preemption. It violates corporate rights, etc. Well, the Seldon of attorneys had this epiphany moment and they said, you know, the, the farmers are asking for a law, which we understand is illegal, but they're willing to pass it anyway, mm -hmm. just to say, you know, to push back and say, this is unjust, this is outrageous. And so they did, that was the, they shifted and Seldiff became a leading, the leading organization in the movement that I'm part of, the community rights mm -hmm. movement. Okay. Yeah. Right, okay. And, and this Tom mm -hmm. Lindsay is the head attorney? Yeah, that, he's the right. founding director and he's the lead attorney. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so, so they, they, they changed their focus. What, what happened with the factory farm? Uh, so the, f the, the law was written. It banned uh, non-family owned corporations from engaging in farming or owning farmland. It was passed unanimously by the township supervisors and the factory farm company decided to pull their application. Oh. No fight, no lawsuit. And it spread very rapidly and 20 other uh, rural conservative communities in uh, townships in Pennsylvania rapidly passed the same ordinance and they all stopped factory farms. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. That was the beginning right. of the community rights that's movement. A, the, the, no, that's, that's a pretty powerful beginning. It was. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, as time has gone on, I presume that this movement has continued uh, and there must be some corporate pushback. There is, but there's surprisingly little. So there's now 200 communities in nine states that have passed these. Uh, we finally have a state on the West Coast. California's Mendocino County passed one in November. Mm -hmm. It's the first time our West Coast states have passed one of these. They're mostly New England so far, Northeast states. Um, and really until in the early years, there was a lot of pushback by state government saying this violates state preemption. They were under a lot of pressure from the uh, ag corporations. But the, ag, the corporate leaders would rather not be the ones out front suing a local government. It doesn't look good. Mm 
No. Because basically they're saying, you folks have no right to decide what happens in your own community. And that's not where a corporate leader wants to be, mm -hmm. you know, located in that battle. So they'd rather go behind the scenes and put pressure, which they're very good at, on the state elected officials and have the state come to them and say, you can't do that, it's illegal. So that's what happened for years in, uh, early, in the early years of the movement. Um, the Pennsylvania legislature sued many of these communities, and the community's response was basically, screw you. We are not going to take these law off the laws off the books. And how dare you tell us mm -hmm. that we don't have self-governing authority in our community when our state constitution says that consent to the governed is an absolute core piece of government. And without consent to the governed, government's not legitimate. Mm -hmm. And you're not following consent to the governed. So in fact, two of the 20 Pennsylvania townships amended their ordinance to say that if the state attempted to enforce the ordinance in their local communities, they would initiate secession from the state of Pennsylvania. They would hmm. secede as a township mm -hmm. legally from the state. Okay. And it, so, so far, that just backed the, the state right off. And the, the state has actually backed off? The state and, never followed through on, on enforcement. And how many years ago was this? That was, uh, 90, that was nine, 1999 to 2002-ish, hmm. was those 20 communities. Mm -hmm. And then 80 Pennsylvania rural communities banned toxic sludge dumping on farmland by corporations. So within a handful of years, 100 communities, half of the 200 that have already been passed, mm -hmm. in 15 years happened in the first few years in Pennsylvania. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's a hotbed of conservative anti-corporate rural activism. Y yes. Rural well, Pennsylvania. Right. Yeah, and, and I, I think for, for probably most people in, in Portland, uh, they would think that uh, it would be liberals. Right. Uh, that would be providing the, the hotbed, right. <laughs> not conservatives. It's one of the reasons I love being part of the community rights movement is that it's very non-ideological. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the harder work is convincing liberals to get involved in this work because liberals tend to trust the federal government um, passing regulatory laws to protect communities. Mm -hmm. But for decades, that has simply not been true. It's not happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So we, we, we have this collection of rather small communities in Pennsylvania, Yeah. Um, what happened next? Well, um, a lot of things changed when Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania got involved in this work about four years ago. Um, the ordinances went from being simple bans to being about rights. So from that point forward, the, the city council by a seven to zero vote banned fracking, and they redesigned, uh, Seldef working with the Pittsburgh city council kind of redesigned what the ordinances were about. They were not just bans anymore. They were designed as rights-based, and this was a right to water and self-government ordinance that Pittsburgh City Council passed. And from that point forward, all of the ordinances in the movement around the country have been uh, the right to water, the right to clean air, the right to self-government, the right to a sustainable future, the right to renewable energy, the right to sustainable infrastructure, and then within the rights-based framework, you have a ban on a particular corporate activity because that activity violates the rights newly established by the town. Okay. So that's the relationship, sort of causal relationship. And each of the ordinances does two other things. It strips that sector of corporations of all their constitutional rights within the municipal boundary or county boundary and it enshrines the right of a local government, a local people to govern themselves, okay. which has not been legal f since the American Revolution, basically, mm -hmm. short first decade after the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. But if the Supreme Court says that corporations are people and have rights, mm -hmm. then this sets up a, what shall I say, a serious conflict? Yes. Uh, very purposeful. Okay. Yeah. yeah um, talk uh, just a bit about that. Yeah, so um, the ordinances are drafted in order to force a very specific kind of legal challenge. The corporate lawyers are forced to make the arguments we want them to make to try to uh, reverse the ban that's passed in a lo by a local government. So uh, corporate lawyers are forced to argue that the corporate it you know, because corporations aren't, aren't actually in existence, it's an it, it's a legal fiction it, mm -hmm. that the it 
has more constitutionally protected rights than the residents of that town. Something a corporate lawyer really doesn't want to argue in a county courthouse. Um, the um, the way that the I'm just I just went blank it does not happen <laughs> very often. <laughs> Let's see. You asked about. Um, I, I asked about the conflict uh, that set up when um, right. when communities assert this when the Supreme Court is saying corporations have rights yes. and, and are people. We don't actually. We understand that the courts are not our allies and probably will never be our allies, at least not the federal courts, because mm -hmm. we don't directly elect them as the public. And so the work is not to try to win a court a court case. We actually assume we're going to lose in the courtroom repeatedly. The work is to really, whether a court case gives us a win or, or a loss, it's to bring a basic democratic uprising the culture of, of, of the public rising up and saying, how dare the state or how dare the federal government or how dare the courts tell us, the people of this local town or county, that we don't have the authority to protect our own health and welfare. And so what's happening in community after community is that, and, and actually Oregon is, is, uh, is the leader in this, um, in, in Josephine County, Oregon, which is where Grants Pass and Cave Junction are, mm -hmm. um, they wrote into an ordinance uh, which they haven't yet passed that would ban pesticide spraying on forest and farmland countywide by corporations. Um, they wrote into their ordinance that if their ordinance is overruled by the courts, the residents of Josephine County shall have the legal authority to commit nonviolent civil disobedience to enforce the law and that their civil disobedience action will be considered fully legal under county law. Hmm. And they wrote that into the ordinance. Okay. So again, it's the question of who are we and what's our relationship with our government? And mm -hmm. so we're used to, and I think liberals are, are more susceptible to, to this than conservatives, we're used to just sitting on our hands when the courts say you lost. Mm -hmm. Right? We don't fight at that point. Well, the, the constitutional structures are really clear that we the people are the sovereign. Government serves us. That's the relationship. When we don't, uh, w when consent to the government is not being met, why are we sitting on our hands, mm -hmm. right? Why aren't we saying this is not an acceptable response from government and we're going to overrule government through our collective action as we the people? Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of, of, of jurisdictional crisis that our work is very purposefully generating. All right, good. Um, so you mentioned that in Josephine County here in Oregon, uh, that there is a, uh, it's going to be on the ballot? Is, is that It was on the ballot it? It in November, the, okay. and it got about 30% of the vote, and they're going to run it again in two ah, years. Okay. Because one of the things that we also do in this movement is we understand that our work is about changing the structures of law, not just an individual law, mm -hmm. and that it might take 10 or 20 years in every county to get that. Mm -hmm. And so Spokane is really the hero so far. They've run the same ballot initiative three times every two years and they're getting closer and closer to winning every time. And the opposition's getting more and more nasty. Yeah. Um, hundreds of thousands of dollars thrown at the Spokane ordinance uh, last year. And the, a group called Oregonians for Food and Shelter, which is a, a fake grassroots organization run by corporate agriculture and the building industry mm -hmm. uh, and the logging companies. That's Oregonians for Food and Shelter. Um, they threw enorm tens of thousands of dollars and a lot of glossy uh, flyers full of lies mm. at um, the campaign in Josephine County to mm. defeat it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So in Philadelphia, the city Pittsburgh. council passed this. In Pittsburgh, yeah. Uh, Pittsburgh, excuse yeah. me, in Pittsburgh. The city council actually passed this, is that correct? That's right. It, it didn't, didn't go to a from, ballot. It didn't come from activists at all. It came from a visionary city council person named Doug Shields who mm -hmm. contacted Seldeth directly. So that yeah. would be one one way of moving forward. Would yeah, be, that's a uh, quick way to move forward, uh, yeah, is, is if you right. can just get your yeah. local electeds to pass yeah. it. And, and, and then in Spokane, they're trying the ballot measure. Thing. Yes. Talk more about Spokane. This is the third time they've already had it on the ballot, is that right? So Spokane has, quite a, has been quite a battle. Um, let's see, this is... 2014. So, uh, 10, 12. In November of 2008, 
Um, they got 25% of the vote. It was a 13 point, thir 13 plank um, ordinance. It was, it, was thir it, was thir it was a Bill of Rights with 13 rights. And they got uh, a quarter of the population voted yes to support this new Community Bill of Rights that was labor rights, environmental rights, rights for nature, uh, and neighborhood rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wh which I'll point out for people who are listening is that 25% on the initial get out uh, and vote on something, on a brand new idea that's yeah. not been talked about before, that's really pretty stunning. That's what they thought. Yeah. They were actually impressed because they, they were outspent 10 to 1 by the business uh, associations. Not a single local elected official was willing to t get anywhere near them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they th and the, one of the things that we, in our movement that we say is we define what a win is. And, tw and they looked at that and they said, we won. Oh, yeah. In terms of the culture shift that you're talking about. So they ran it two years later and they took their 13 um, rights in their Bill of Rights and they brought it down to four, much simpler to understand. Mm -hmm. And their goal was 35 or 40 percent. And they got 49.7 percent. That's almost majority. They lost for nine, by <laughs> 900 votes. Wow, okay. Yeah. yeah. And they were, you know, I mean, they were both excited and devastated, as you can imagine, that they got that close. So that was in 2010, November. And then November 2012, and you have to, you know, remember it's like every time they're having to collect 20,000 signatures, a huge amount of work to get this on the ballot each time. This time, the powers that be recognized they would probably lose. And so they mobilized not only political money from, the, from business associations literally all over the United States, but the county government did a suit in conjunction with 14 business associations in the county, and they sued to keep it off the ballot, mm. and they won. So in November 2012, it never made it to a ballot. And what was the basis of, of, of preventing it from being on the ballot? It was a whole bunch of different arguments. The only one that I can recall right now is something called the single subject rule, um, where they claimed that it wasn't a single subject. Uh -huh. Yeah. And um, we had won single subject rule court decisions for years in Washington state already mm -hmm. with these. It sounds like, I mean, a single sub it, 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 the single subject rule isn't quite what it sounds like. All that's required, supposedly, but again, judges are political, right. uh -huh. is that there is a unifying feature to all of the aspects of the ordinance. And there right. was, it was mm -hmm. a Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. And so that had passed the judge's test year after year. Mm -hmm. But not this judge. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. All right. And, and so uh, this uh, pattern of being challenged in the courts is one that seems to be coming more, yes. more and more prominent. So just in the last few years, we've had um, one of the most exciting court cases that sadly is about to um, be dissolved instead of heard is in Mora County, New Mexico, where a very group. A brave group of folks in a very poor, mostly Hispanic and native county in northern New Mexico passed a ban on all hydrocarbon removal, not just fracking, but mining and oil drilling. Mm -hmm. And the campaign had to actually run its own candidates to get a majority of people on the ballot, I mean, on the, uh, to get to be elected at the county commission level so that they could get this thing passed. It's a mm -hmm. three member commission. They elected enough people to get two of them to vote yes. Mm -hmm. And they were sued by the Independent Petroleum Association of New Mexico and I think Shell or Chevron. It was two different lawsuits. And everybody was very excited about this because it was going to be one of, our, one of the first really major legal battles in our movement. Because uh, we actually, we're one of these weird campaigns that likes it when we're sued. That's part oh. of the political mm -hmm. campaign for us. But sadly, what happened was that one of the people who they had elected lost in the next election, and now they're going to take it, they, in, 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 instead of going through with the lawsuit, the new majority on the county commission is about to take it off the books. Uh -huh. And so we're not going to get our chance uh -huh. to see this process through. Okay. All right. So there, there's a lot of a lot of road bumps. There are certainly. This this right. is long term. Yeah, strategic right. organizing. Yeah. Right. yeah. So we only have a few more minutes. Okay. I, I want to be sure that you talk about uh, the community rights 
movement here in Portland or, yeah. or in Oregon more generally, but yeah. just for a couple minutes. So um, the community, if you can check out our local group at communityrightspdx.org, we have an active group that's been meeting for a couple of years for Multnomah County, and we hope to get something on the ballot. Well, we hope to go public with a ballot initiative that we may have a year of legal battles just to get to the point where we're collecting signatures for it. But we hope to be public within three to six months, mm -hmm. finally. Um, there is um, a group that launched, the most recent group in the state is in Columbia County, very close to here. That's uh, Scapoose and, and oh, Clatskanai, okay. Hel St. Helens, Rainier, mm -hmm. on the river, on the Columbia River. They have moved very rapidly because they have a crisis on their hands, which usually makes people move faster. Mm -hmm. They have this uh, oil terminal that's going to be built in Klatskanai at the edge of organic farms. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and uh, they're building all sorts of new offloading facilities um, for all sorts of you know horrible stuff going to China, mm -hmm. petroleum mm -hmm. products. Mm -hmm. So the the, the Columbia County group already has written an ordinance. It's already been filed. Um, I wish I could remember the website, but if you, if you put in Columbia County Community Rights, it'll come up okay. on Google, and you can read the ordinance which would ban coal and oil trains from passing through Columbia County, and it will be on the ballot this spring. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, it, it will be on the it ballot? Will, well, oh. they're, they've, they're or, currently least, collecting signatures. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right, and, and then you mentioned Josephine County. Josephine County will try again in a few years. Mm -hmm. Benton and Lane County have a right to a local food system campaign that would ban GMO agriculture countywide. Benton will be on the ballot this spring as well. Lane County is still battling against its ideologically driven county attorney mm -hmm. who just keeps coming up with one excuse after another why it can't be, mm -hmm. can't go to signature gathering. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it yeah. does, uh, now we only got about 15 seconds okay. left. Uh, it, does CELDEF, um, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, help uh, these local e um, efforts? They do. Uh, once a community is, um, is functional enough to start writing the ordinance, CELDEF comes in and gives them support. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Good, good. Well, yeah. thank you very much. And unfortunately, we are, yeah. our time is just about out, and so we'll... Um, we will now go to um, some uh, public service announcements. So if you have a pen or pencil, want to get it out, you might want to be able to uh, jot some of this down. Uh, so first of all, uh, to get Dr. Don's local broadcast schedule, you can go to www.donbayam.com and just click on present day activities. Um, and uh, Dr. Don's show on the on the web. Uh, you can just go Dr. Don YouTube, and then you can uh, choose a particular program to watch. And um, uh, and then the Alliance for Democracy. Uh, I don't think we have the graphic for that. Um, the Alliance for Democracy is a national grassroots progressive populist organization. Uh, founded in 1996 to challenge power of large corporations with a mission to establish true democracy and a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. You'll learn more about them at their national website, thealliancefordemocracy.org, or uh, go to the Portland website, afd-pdx.org. Let's see, and then uh, corporate personhood. Let, well, let's see. Um, okay, corporate personhood. I'm not sure if we have a graphic on the corporate personhood, but uh, we do want to say that since the Supreme Court in 2009 uh, announced their decision that corporations are recognized as persons with uh, the rights, the constitutional rights of real people, uh, there has been a movement to amend the Constitution to end corporate personhood and also end money as speech. And so if you uh, go to movetoamend.org, they have a petition there that you can sign and other ways that you can get involved with that activity. Uh, here in Portland, uh, the Alliance for Democracy um, uh, is a good way to connect into that activity as well. Um, so let's see. Um, I, I actually now I have a few extra uh, uh, the second series. So, do you, do you have a, a final message uh, that you can 
Well, no matter where you're, you're watching from, I would really encourage you to check out the Community Rights Movement. In fact, if you go to YouTube and put in the words Community Rights TV, you'll get dozens and dozens of interviews and oh. lectures, and it's kind of a fun intro point, Community mm -hmm. Rights TV on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, and, um, and there, are, there are now groups uh, in more than a dozen states, and there are active campaigns in nine states. So right. um, come to paulcienfuegos.com and ask me questions if you're seeing this right. from another part of the country and you want to know where to plug yeah. in. And you do, you do workshops. I go all over the, the United Portland States. Yeah, okay. I will be spending my seventh visit in Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, starting in a few weeks, okay. helping those folks try to stop frack sand mines from destroying their landscape. I only, I only want to know yep. what a frack sand mine is. It's not a pretty story. <laughs> I'm sure it's not. Okay. All right. So anyway, it is now time to say goodbye. Uh, we want to uh, thank you for uh, watching, and we want to thank our crew here and to the managers and teachers here at the studios in the Portland, Oregon metro area where conversations with Dr. Don uh, shows are produced. So uh, thank you to the viewers for watching. Um, I will also say again, uh, because this is something that I work on a lot, it is a constitutional amendment. Uh, to say that corporations are not people and money is not speech, please go and pick up your phone and call your U.S. senators as well as your U.S. representative and tell them that that's what you want. So thanks again for watching and remember, KFC, not that KFC, Dr. Don's KFC, <laughs> kind, friendly, charitable. Be kind, be friendly, be charitable to all of you and to yourself. Goodbye.